also uh, part of our class on digital literature. And when I was putting together this class, I uh, was, you know, hatching in my mind over topics I'd like to have included. And I thought, well, digital folklore might be an interesting topic. Can't say I know that much about it. And I thought, well, maybe I know somebody who does know something about this topic. And he uh, was quite happily uh, able to, uh, to give us a guest lecture tonight. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey A. Talbert. He is assistant professor at um, Penn State Harrisburg uh, in the Department of American Studies, is it? That's right. And um, the, his talk tonight is entitled Slender Man and Belief in the Digital Age. Uh, before I turn it over to him, I'll just read out our territorial acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that are made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So uh, if you'd like, I could turn it over to you now, Jeff. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the introduction, Marianne. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to see uh, so many folks. Sea being a, a metaphor, of course, since it's mostly a sea of, of uh, black boxes, but this is the Zoom reality that we're living in now. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you all so you can see my slides, and then we will be off to the races. So. Here we go. Okay, is everybody able to see this all right? Thank you very much. Okay. So um, I am, as uh, Murray said in his introduction, I am a folklorist. Uh, by training, which is uh, a real discipline. It's not something that I made up. I actually have a PhD in folklore. Um, I think not a lot of folks recognize that, that, or realize, I should say, that folklore is actually a, an independent discipline. Um, but we have quite a lot in common with cultural and linguistic anthropologists. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that matters in, in this context a little bit later. Um, but before we really get started with the subject of tonight's talk, it's, it's sort of necessary for me to explain a little bit about how, how folklorists approach this material, um, which might be a little bit different from what you, um, what you might expect when you hear the word folklore. Um, one uh, very well-known definition of folklore was this one that's on your screen now that was put forth by a folklorist named Dan Benamos which is um, folklore as artistic communication in small groups. Now that's, that's something of a, a, an antiquated definition at this point, that's from um, the early 1970s, but it cues our attention to the kinds of things that folklorists are still interested in today. Um, communication, creativity or artistry, and to some extent, at least the notion of group. And all of those are things that can be problematized and uh, have been problematized, in fact. But that, again, gives us kind of a good starting point to discuss what folklore is and, and how folklorists uh, approach these things. Um, the stuff that we call folklore isn't just old stories or quaint customs like bas basket weaving, although it is those things too. Um, today, folklorists view folklore as that part of every culture, which is ordinary, everyday, and normal, that expresses things about, to, and for the people who produce and perform it, and which generally takes place outside of, alongside, in opposition to, in the interstices of, or despite, official social institutions. So this is really broad, and that's a strength of folklore study. It can include just about everything. Um, people study comics and fan culture, video games and steampunk conventions, fairy tales and classical mythology, all under the banner of folklore. An important point is that these days we, we focus on folklore not only as product, so not only a, a story or a game or a song, 
but more properly, on we focus on folklore as the vernacular communicative processes and performances which give rise to stories and games and songs and in which those things circulate and, and are used by people as part of their cultural existence. And vernacular in this context just means common, ordinary, everyday. The items that may be a part of any folkloric performance, like a particular type of story, are actually just the starting point for deeper discussions of culture. We study these things through ethnography, uh, precisely as anthropologists, sociologists, and others do. The difference is that we enter the conversation about human culture from the perspective of those vernacular processes and accompanying texts and performances. So we might begin by saying, I'm very interested in this local legend about a haunted house, but we don't stop at the level of that local legend, that particular type of story. We use that as a point of entry into understanding something else about the local culture or about people's engagement with belief or place or uh, any of an, any number of other things. Um, but we don't stop at that level either. We use ethnographic research in order to move outward from these items and texts into that broader cultural context. So like anthropologists, we live with people, we interview them, we participate in their lives, and we write about our experiences doing these things. So having said all that, every discipline needs jargon, and we have plenty of it in folklore. And sometimes you might hear me use the term folkloristics to refer to the discipline which studies folklore. Sometimes we use the words folklore and folkloristics almost synonymously, which can get a little bit confusing, but folkloristics typically will refer to the discipline which studies this stuff called folklore. So although we are interested in holistic understandings of people's lives and, and their experiences of culture, we do again begin by looking at particular kinds of things. Very often, the particular kinds of things that folklorists begin looking at fall into this category of culture that we call verbal arts. Verbal arts, in turn, comprises a large number of um, genres of folklore, including things like folk speech or slang, jokes, riddles, and proverbs. And it also includes narrative genres, like legends, myths, folk and fairy tales and personal narratives. Um, these are some, some pretty fundamental distinctions that are made in folklore study. And um, it can also get confusing because they're often used in ordinary speech in a way that is quite different from how disciplinary folklorists use the terms. Um, so it bears lingering on these terms for just a minute before we get into what's to come. Legends, and you'll note that I've circled two of the, the genres here. I'll explain what that's about in just a minute. Um, but legends are typically understood by folklorists as stories that are told as if possibly true. They make truth claims about the world. Um, they're set in real time, which is in, um, which is in contrast to myths, which are typically set out, outside of time or before history begins. Um, Legends involve uh, both real or possibly real historic personages as well as supernatural beings, gods, monsters, ghosts, whatever. Um, myths, on the other hand, as I said, are, are outside of ordinary history and they're best understood as sacred creation stories. So things about how the world came into being, about how uh, features of the landscape became what they are, uh, etc. Myths are also making truth claims about the world, but they're doing so in a different register than legends are. Folk and fairy tales are um, narratives that are not told as if true. They're told as fictions for entertainment, for educational purposes, um, and they can have all kinds of important things to say about a community and its culture and its practices and aspects of its life and belief but the content of the story is not told as if true. So these are narratives that aren't making truth claims about the world in the same way that those first two genres are doing. 
And finally, personal narratives are stories that I tell about me and about my experience. Um, and there can be a lot of slippage between these categories. And in fact, genre is very arbitrary, ultimately. Um, these are analytic categories that have helped folklorists to talk about some of the different kinds of stories that people tell. But in real life, so to speak, on the ground, things are much, much messier than this. And these categories quickly break down so that uh, personal narratives often bleed into legends by participation. If you've ever heard the term legend tripping, that refers to when people visit a place uh, specifically because it is associated with a legend, usually a legend that has some supernatural content, um, in order to sort of participate in the legend. Maybe they go to a haunted house in the hopes of seeing the ghost, or um, they climb a particular set of stairs in the hopes that when they get to the top, a mysterious 13th stair will appear and something supernatural will happen as a result of that. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of slippage and overlap between these categories, but they help us start to talk about some of the things that uh, folklorists are interested in when it comes to narrative. Now I've, I've circled legends and personal narratives here because they're the genres in which uh, the supernatural in the contemporary world uh, tends most often to be represented. Legends as well as personal narratives imply belief or the possibility of belief. But like belief itself, they are shiftable and inconstant. Some people don't believe in these kinds of narratives. Some people do, some people are in between, but these stories hold out the possibility of belief. And that's something that's really, really important when we're talking obviously about the supernatural in any context. Um, but I think particularly, as we'll see, um, when we're talking about particular kinds of narratives and particular kinds of media, um, enabled by digital technologies. Um, contemporary legends are a, su a subgenre of the legend genre. And uh, you may have heard the term urban legend that was used previously to describe the same thing. Um, but folklorists have tended to reject that term in recent years, urban legend, because they're, first of all, there may not necessarily be anything urban about such narratives. Um, more to the point, that term implies an old dichotomy between the rural and the urban, and the idea that it was uncommon to find folklore in urban spaces. So people were surprised with, when these types of stories may have shown up in urban spaces, but that's a false binary. And we've moved past that formulation of, of how folklore, which we also call vernacular culture, actually works. So these days we tend to prefer this term, contemporary legend. And uh, in common with all legends, contemporary legends are set in real time and real place. They imply belief or the possibility of belief, but contemporary legends are notable because they're in circulation and they're usually quite close in both time and space to the narrator and to the audience of the legend. Um, so if you've ever heard, for example, the story of a person waking up in a tub of ice with a note stuck to them telling them to see a doctor, only to learn that their kidney has been harvested. Or the famous vanishing hitchhiker legend in which a motorist picks up a, you, almost always a young woman on the side of the road and drops her off at her home, only to later learn that that young woman had actually died some years previously. Um, or perhaps you've heard the one where the babysitter gets high and accidentally puts the turkey in the crib and the baby in the oven. If you've heard any of these, you'll have a good understanding of how much they shift and change and how both unbelievable and potentially believable they can be. Part of the believability of these narratives comes from how highly localized they often are. So people may hear various versions of these stories set in places that are close to them. So the um, vanishing hitchhiker might take place in Indiana, or it might take place in Ontario, or it might take place in Tokyo. Um, core elements of the narrative remain the same very often, even as other details like the location change. So we could of course add other genres to that list that I showed a few slides ago. 
of folklore genres, because again, they are ultimately arbitrary. They're categories that help us to talk about these things. Um, but we could add the category or the genre rather of creepypasta to that list. Creepypasta, as you probably know, is the name for internet-born horror stories that often blend fiction and potentially belief. They might therefore be located somewhere between legends, which are told as true or possibly true, and folk tales, which are told as fictions. Arguably the most famous example of creepypasta is this happy fellow here, Slenderman. Um, Slenderman was created in June 2009 on a website called somethingawful.com in its discussion forums, where a group of users created a friendly contest to see who could create the scariest Photoshopped images. So we know precisely where this guy came from, how he was created, who created him. Uh, but for whatever reason, when the original user who came up with the Slender Man idea, a guy who went by the username Victor Surge, when he posted his original images of Slender Man, which I'll show you a little later in the talk, um, they became really popular in, in the thread on the Something Awful discussion forum. And it kind of exploded. It quickly became the most popular monster or image on the entire thread. And soon other creators, both on somethingawful.com and on other platforms on the internet, began making their own contributions to the emerging Slenderman mythos, as it came to be called. As you also probably know, Slenderman has no face. He's tall and skinny. He wears a black suit and tie, and he causes his victims to go insane. In early stories, he did other things too, like ev eviscerating his victims, uh, sealing their organs in plastic bags, and replacing them in, their, in his victims' bodies. So if you're a horror fan, obviously there may be some things to, to find uh, compelling about Slender Man, but he's also interesting because at least some of his creators in the original Something Awful thread actually wanted to, to make his stories seem as if they were a part of real world folklore. What that means is that in, in one case, for example, a user on the forum um, sort of inserted Slender Man into a real world collection of folk narratives, legends and folk tales uh, from the American South, a real book that actually exists. And the user wrote a short Slender Man narrative uh, and presented it in a format that matched the real world book that he claimed it was in. But I own a copy of the book and no such narrative actually appears in it. So there was this deliberate effort by at least a few users to actually connect Slender Man to real world folklore. And in so doing, I, I argue, to open up Slender Man to this possibility of belief that characterizes the legend genre. Another reason, of course, that Slender Man is interesting um, is because his existence, for better or for worse, has been involved with, or perhaps motivated, real world actions. Um, in the year 2014, in a place called Waukesha, Wisconsin, two young girls, age 12, uh, attempted to kill a friend who was also 12 at the time. They stabbed her 17 times and left her for dead in the forest, uh, after which they proceeded to walk into the woods in the hopes of encountering Slender Man. They believed that sacrificing their friend to him would ingratiate them to the monster, and he would make them into his proxies, which is a term that emerged in the Slender Man mythos for people who sort of become his familiars or servants. Now, creepypasta like Slender Man don't usually express belief in the same way that legends do. Typically, if, if someone tells a traditional story which they know to be false, and they know that their audience knows that it's false, we call that something else. We call that, in folklore, we call that a folktale. But because of the doubt that can be introduced when narratives circulate, 
particularly when they circulate across multiple media platforms where origins become rapidly obscured, stories like Slenderman narratives can become legend. Doubt is the other side of belief and they always go hand in hand. But what we see with, with a number of creepypasta and other kinds of stories and media that circulate on the internet is confusion about the reality or the fictional status of that particular narrative type or the particular truth claims in question. Creepypasta very often play deliberately with this issue of belief and reality, and they deliberately confuse the issue of their own reality. Uh, visitors to sites like the Creepypasta Wiki, where this image is from, can reveal, excuse me, visits, not visitors, to sites like the Creepypasta Wiki can reveal how complex these narratives can be. As with the Midnight Game, which is described on the website as, quote, an old pagan ritual used mainly as punishment for those who have broken the laws of the pagan religion in question. Never mind that pagan religion tells us very little about anything at all. Um, the game, as you can see here, is supposedly a ritual to summon a malevolent entity called the Midnight Man. It's entirely fictional, but the comments section on the Creepypasta Wiki serves to muddy the waters as people seem to either play along with the fiction to treat it as if it's actually a real ritual, uh, or perhaps to be genuinely confused by its ontological status. Here's another uh, well-known creepypasta. And uh, hopefully I can get this to actually play, but perhaps not. Um, I'm not sure if you all can hear the audio or not on your computers, but I'll, I'll just let this go for just a couple seconds because it's very annoying. Can you all hear that? Um, this, of course, is a oh, thank you, Karina. I appreciate it. This, of course, is Lavender Town from the Pokemon franchise of video games. Um, this is a town that the player can visit in the video game, which features a, uh, a weird and eerie background song. The town's eerie music became the subject of a creepypasta in which a large number of Japanese children supposedly committed suicide after hearing it. Lavender Town Syndrome. Again, fiction and fact here are mixed. The song and the game are real. The frightening event that's linked to them is not real. Now, moving away for a moment from creepypasta as another example of belief in digital context, one of my personal favorites, the Supernatural for Sale. Another example of a playfully confusing approach to supernatural belief is the haunted items that are for sale online, which you can acquire on eBay and other places right now. Um, and I apologize for the small size of these screen captures, but hopefully they give you a sense of the kinds of things that you can see if you look them up on eBay eBay has, in fact, an entire psychic and paranormal items category. Um, searching around on eBay a few months ago, I found a listing for a haunted doll. And in the item description for this doll, the seller wrote, quote, I am required, as per eBay's policy on the paranormal, to indicate that eBay forbids the sale of intangible items. And this listing is for only a tangible doll, in all caps, with no promise of spirit attached. eBay requires me to say that this is all for entertainment purposes only. I found that very interesting, particularly because the attached story about the doll uh, contradicted that disclaimer pretty, pretty roundly, uh, including this line, quote, please be prepared for paranormal activity if you decide to adopt Ashley. She is a very active, playful little girl. So which part of that text should we take seriously? By the way, Ashley was available at the time for the low, low price of $65. If you ever wanted to purchase a haunted doll for your home, you can find them very affordably. 
I myself actually recently purchased a Dybbuk box from eBay. If you're not familiar, a Dybbuk is an evil spirit from Jewish folklore and a relatively recent trend has people claiming that these spirits can be contained inside boxes, usually sealed with wax. Many are for sale online. Mine costs just $29.99. So all of this begs the question, how does this stuff complicate the idea of belief? Often today, people who hold supernatural or other non-normative beliefs who accept forms of evidence that don't meet scientific standards are labeled in decidedly unsympathetic terms. Folklorist David Hufford notes that such labeling practices are related to the differing assumptions at the core of official and folk beliefs. Hufford writes, those media that explicitly propagate some folk beliefs, such as tabloid newspapers and TV shows, serve to stigmatize them even as they promote them. Spiritual beliefs and related experiences are placed alongside Elvis sightings and pictures of the president conferring with aliens. This illustrates the advantage enjoyed by official beliefs over folk beliefs. So that's an important point that folklorists try to keep in mind, that belief comes with certain statuses attached. But belief is something that we all do. Belief is a kind of knowing, a process by which we all make sense of the world. We believe things that may come from our own personal experience, that we shouldn't touch a hot stove, for example, as well as things that we learn from experts, from books, from our families. Beliefs are ideas about the world and how the world is. And while some of them are based in science, in Western empirical-based science, that is, not all are. So folklorists take belief seriously. Following David Hufford, we understand that belief can be rational, which does not mean right, by the way. A belief can be entirely rational and entirely wrong. We also understand that belief is variable. It's changing, it's mutable. Folklorists tend to view belief as a process rather than as a fixed and stable thing. Digital channels enable beliefs to be communicated and contested in ways that weren't possible before, at speeds that weren't possible before, as with Slender Man. Unfortunately, these same channels often help to obscure important aspects of the truth claims that certain media make. This can contribute to confusion, doubt, and sometimes to unfortunate events like the Slender Man stabbing. For a more contemporary example, consider demonstrably false truth claims like the QAnon conspiracy theory or Pizzagate and the general flood of this awful thing that we now call fake news. By mentioning these things, I don't mean to imply that supernatural belief is fake news or that we need to root it out. I don't mean to imply that there's any direct equivalency except on the issue of belief and how beliefs are formed in the minds of individual humans. Belief in a general sense, supernatural or otherwise, matters immensely, and understanding how people form beliefs about the world is critical. We can do this by taking what Hufford calls the experiential approach to the study of belief. Hufford, in a, a landmark work that he wrote in the early 1980s called The Terror That Comes in the Night, which I think is one of the greatest titles for an academic book ever, um, he wrote about a phenomenon called the old hag. Uh, he used that term because that's the term that he encountered among people where he was working at the time in Newfoundland. Um, the idea of this experience, which he dubbed the old hag experience, is that a person will be sleeping at night and awaken to find themselves unable to move. Um, and it was accompanied by a number of other feelings that characterized pretty much every occurrence of this event. Like, uh, I, I forget the entire list, but things like um, feeling as though you were being pushed down, that, that there was a weight on you, that there was a presence in the room, um, an experience of, of intense fear. 
In beginning to examine this phenomenon, he, Hufford soon learned that people elsewhere in the world, even outside of Newfoundland, had virtually the same experience. They described the same experience, even in places wherein there was no traditional framework explaining it. In Newfoundland, the old hag was believed to be the spirit of someone maybe who was jealous of you or who had some reason to um, have harbor some negative feelings to you, even if they didn't intentionally want to harm you. Um, similar in some ways, I think, to the evil eye tradition of some other cultures. Um, but Hufford found that even in parts of the world where there wasn't a traditional knowledge framework for understanding this event, people were still reporting this same experience. So this realization led Hufford to, um, to develop what he calls the experiential approach to belief. And that is very simply the idea that some supernatural beliefs, and I think we can extend this to include other kinds of non-normative beliefs as well, um, but some supernatural beliefs are based actually on real experiences that people have, which they do their best to observe rationally. Now that doesn't mean that their interpretations of those events are necessarily accurate. Hufford is not suggesting that the supernatural is real. He's also not suggesting that it's false. Rather, he's suggesting that when a phenomenon is sufficiently widespread, even in places where there is not uh, an existing framework to um, preemptively compel people to reach a certain conclusion, that scholars should take that seriously. Should, scholars should take reports of that phenomenon seriously. So in this way, by taking what Hufford has called the experiential approach, we can understand and respect the role of fairies, for example, in Ireland or Newfoundland or Scotland, of ghosts in the lives of paranormal investigators. And we can continue to enjoy Slenderman stories without anyone getting hurt. It can be tempting to reject beliefs that contrast with our own and to label the people who hold them as silly or perhaps deviant. This is especially true, I think, in the era of discourses or conversations about media literacy, for example, and again, fake news and mis and disinformation. But a response that dismisses people who fall for those kinds of beliefs as silly or deviant ignores the complexity of belief and the complexity of the process of believing. And it ignores the very reasonable processes that can lead people to certain beliefs, which may ultimately be unreasonable beliefs. But that doesn't mean that the people bypass a process of rational thinking in order to get there. It can, it can mean that, but it needn't always be taken to mean that. In a year like 2021, we have to cultivate empathy. The age of disinformation and conspiracy theories demands and, uh, an understanding of how baffling and how vast the digital environment is. Oh, my pictures went away. How easily manipulable it is and how easy it is to miss important clues. It's also important to understand the kinds of fun that people can have with the idea of belief and how that fun often depends on ambiguity and ambivalence. So the pictures that were here a moment ago and which have now vanished, will probably vanish again. Um, these are the first two pictures of Slender Man, the ones created by Victor Serge on that Something Awful forum back in June of 2009. They were accompanied by some text that Victor Serge wrote, which explained that the pictures were recovered from a mysterious fire at a library, and that the day after these images were taken, 14 children disappeared. People who regularly participated in the original discussion forum where Slenderman was created were familiar with the language and the ethos of that digital space. And they understood the irony and the humor underlying these scary images, which again were created as part of a challenge to see who could make the scariest Photoshop images. But an outsider 
or a person who encountered Slenderman media elsewhere, for example, on YouTube or on a creepypasta site, might not recognize its fictional status. I've written previously about how Slenderman thus stands alongside certain other infamous cases of fictional supernatural media confused for fact. The infamous BBC television broadcast, Ghostwatch, uh, The Blair Witch Project, and even an Animal Planet documentary with quote fingers about mermaids. In all three of these cases, uh, elements of truth and fiction became confused. Um, Dr. Murray Leader has written, in fact, about Ghostwatch as one of those infamous cases um, in which uh, the affordances of media enabled a production that framed itself as an investigation into a haunting in a London home um, was taken as potentially true or potentially real by some of its viewers. If you're not familiar with Ghostwatch, it's a, it's a prime time made for television movie that was presented as if it were an actual prime time investigative journalistic piece looking into a haunting in London that um, paralleled the real world haunting called the Enfield Poltergeist. Um, but Ghostwatch was particularly notable for foregrounding the trappings of media and media technology and media personalities. Um, it was presented by Michael Parkinson, who was a real BBC presenter, a, a known and trusted figure at the time, uh, and featured a number of other celebrities and television personalities involved in investigating this supposed haunting. Well, as, um, as Dr. Leader has, has written, uh, Ghostwatch, was traumatic for some of its viewers who took it to be real. So effectively did it make uh, or take advantage rather of these affordances of technology. They would do things in the film like, you know, show the camera crew as they interacted with other people on, on, um, on site and in the studio. Um, it's a very compelling example of how the skillful and clever manipulation of media um, can lead to confusion. The Blair Witch Project similarly had people from Maryland, which incidentally is where I'm from in the US, um, wondering if the story of uh, the Blair Witch was true and um, committing petty acts of vandalism in Burkittsville, Maryland, the, the real town where the bulk of the action of the Blair Witch Project was set. Um, and then the Animal Planet doc documentary, which was called Mermaids, The Body Found, featured uh, a debunked theory about a branch of humans who had evolved to live underwater and um, confused viewers of that program uh, called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States asking if there had in fact been evidence of um, aquatic humanoids. Part of the issue with these media seems to be that much contemporary media obscures its own origins. We see the finished product, but not the writing or the filming, not the creation of props, not the coding of websites or algorithms. Keeping in mind the endless manipulability of digital media will help us to avoid the worst missteps of believing. It should also help us cultivate empathy for people whose beliefs are shaped just as ours are by the networks in which they live. The supernatural as a category that has been so thoroughly stigmatized in the contemporary Western world finds new life in the obscuring channels of digital media. By that I mean again that because so many of the so many of the uh, characteristics of digital media are obscured either deliberately or simply as a result of the nature of digital media, they lend themselves to particular interpretations of their own truth claims. Uh, we, for so long in the Western world, we have been taught to believe that uh, video and photography are uh, the closest to accurate representations of the world. 
one result of that is that even though we are aware of the affordances of newer digital technologies and the high degree of manipulability of such media, uh, even though we know those things, we still tend to find in the Western world visual media to be particularly compelling, to be particularly um, convincing, to have a particular kind of evidentiary weight. Understanding that as we move through digital environments is, is of course key. And I think probably most people recognize that on a certain level. But as a folklorist interested in processes of belief as one part of this larger arena called vernacular culture, I find it especially interesting how the internet with all of the various technologies that that term includes um, facilitates not only the kind of obscuring quality that I mentioned with regard to media, but also community formation and interaction with other human users as well as non-human agents um, that allows a sense of connectedness to form, that allows a sense again of community or of network to form amongst users in particular contexts. So while the something awful forum users they were in on the joke. They knew the reality of Slenderman. When Slenderman sort of moved beyond the boundaries of that original discussion forum, the stakes started to change as aspects of the creation of Slenderman became obscured. And again, other users in that original forum actually sought to create artifacts or fragments of discourse that would make Slenderman seem um, convincingly real. Some of the most famous uh, Slenderman um, artifacts of that kind are um, uh, a woodcut based on, um, I believe, on a real medieval woodcut, but it was edited in such a way as to depict a creature that looked like Slenderman. That and other efforts to um, write a historical record for this figure, for Slenderman, uh, created a sense of verisimilitude uh, that is not always possible in all instances, and it doesn't always happen with all media. But because of the combination of the particip participatory nature of networked digital technologies, and because of the unique affordances of visual media, uh, Slenderman was able to become this phenomenon that blurred its own origins in a very powerful and very compelling way. When we think about other online discourses that move through similar environments and that similarly pass through many, many hands, um, sometimes in real time, sometimes asynchronously, it's very important for us to remember first for our own safety that those are the realities of digital technologies because of course we don't want to be taken in by many of the admittedly nefarious actors that do exist in these digital spaces. Um, but also, understanding that because of the incredible complexity of these processes, that sometimes people are taken in by fictional or unreal narratives that masquerade as truthful or real. And it's not, it's not to say that we need to be accepting of people who propagate such media or who act on them. Rather, we should try to cultivate sympathy or empathy rather for the, the the fact that these processes are so powerful they're so widespread uh, and it doesn't take a great deal of decontextualization for a narrative to be com completely and oddly and weirdly compelling I wonder if I can give you an example that's a little bit embarrassing, but there was a, a similar sort of false narrative circulating on the internet fairly recently um, that claimed that um, men who had beards had uh, particular accumulations of, we'll say, bathroom related dirt that would accumulate in their beards. And uh, this, of course, is a false narrative, but it was a convincing one. One that had me wondering for a while, I have to admit. It feels silly admitting that in a recorded talk, but this is the power of the types of media with which we are inundated constantly. Decontextualized claims, narratives that purport to um, recount real experiences 
all of these types of media and narratives circulating through any kind of a media context, but I think particularly through digital media are powerful in very, very unexpected ways. So we should not accept patently false or harmful narratives, but we also should try to understand how people may come to believe them because of our limited perspectives on the digital environments with which we are always interacting. We always only have one view from which to see the world of digital technologies. And even though the answers to many of these kinds of questions are in a very literal sense at our fingertips, um, there is a tremendous amount of room for oversight, for missteps. And I think if we keep that in mind, as we think our way through this mess of information with which we're always bombarded, we'll come back again to see how some of these theories, which seem so improbable or implausible, can come to seem otherwise to people who are enmeshed in particular discourses in a different way than we are. So for many of us to think that Slender Man was ever real in any sense of that word, might seem ridiculous. It, it may seem very silly to think that this was a real being. Um, but there are all kinds of factors influencing how people interact with these types of media and these types of truth claims. In the case of the two young girls involved in the Waukesha Slender Man stabbing, mental health concerns were very, very um, serious and very operative in that instance. One of the two young girls, in fact, was diagnosed with early onset schizophrenia. She believed that in addition to interacting with Slender Man, that she also received communications from Voldemort, from the Harry Potter franchise, and from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So that, of course, is an extreme case. But the ways in which we all select aspects of experience and aspects of the media that we encounter in our daily lives and incorporate them into our beliefs about the world um, are such that in a very real sense, it can happen to any of us. So the supernatural is particularly useful in that because of its stigmatized status in, in the Western world, it can call our attention in a very pronounced and very focused way to these kinds of flows of information as well as disinformation the truth claims that are made about the world and that are usually made specifically using and specifically relying on particular media affordances. By that I mean, again, the fact, for example, that video is, is very often taken as having a great deal of evidentiary weight or photography as well. Keeping that in mind as we think about the supernatural can help us understand the process of belief as it applies to these other areas, which may seem not to be related at all, but in other ways they really are. If we think about the satanic panic of the 1980s and 1990s, um, if we think again about the contemporary QAnon conspiracy theory, not only do both of those have overt elements of the supernatural, both concerning, in this case, the Christian figure of the devil, um, but they also move through and across and among multiple media platforms and channels in ways that enable a deep inserting of oneself into those narratives in a way that allows a person to be caught up in the flow and perhaps potentially lose sight of the larger picture. So, Slender Man may seem at times to be kind of a silly example, and in some ways it is, um, but I think it's illustrative of what the internet can accomplish. And I don't use accomplish in necessarily a positively or a negatively coded way. Rather, I mean that the affordances and the constraints of digital technologies, the things that it allows us to do and the things that it prevents us from doing are such that a process like the creation of Slender Man and its gradual um, spreading out into so many different areas of digital culture can parallel 
similar processes in other areas that have perhaps far more obvious and far more immediate social and political and cultural results. That is not to say that there is a direct parallel between Slender Man and QAnon. I wouldn't make a claim like that. But similar things appear to be happening when origins are obscured, when truth claims about the world pass through multiple hands, many thousands or millions of hands, in fact, and when the technologies used to replicate, to share those truth claims, uh, have that added tendency to mask the processes of their own construction. So I think that's about it for, for me and Slender Man. Um, maybe we could open it up to some questions. Oh, I'll stop the sh screen share. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I couldn't see the chat window while I was doing the screen share. I apologize. Yeah, I'm sorry for the annoyingness of the Pokemon song. <laughs> Dante says, oh, goodness, the memory. Oh. Murray's not able to unmute himself. Hmm. Uh, I guess I have a question. I don't know if I'm coming through. Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so from reading your paper, I was uh, kind of prompted to look at the Wikipedia page because I was kind of interested in how it ended up being constructed. And then at the very bottom, it was talking about how um, Slenderman is like owned and like private like pri uh, was it privately owned <laughs> and yet like pay for the rights to use slenderman and then wh what do you like does that do something to the belief in the folklore like in that like it's an owned figure that's a really interesting question um yeah i i believe victor serge sold the rights to um, a, a film production company, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think that's what happened. Um, yeah, the answer is it, 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 it depends, I guess. Um, I think it depends on, on whether or not audiences ha are aware of that. And um, if they happen to look through the Wikipedia entry and they find that information, then there is reason to believe that that would impact um, their relation to that that creature um, but i would be willing to bet that probably most users of the internet who are interested in creepypasta um, might not do that amount of research um, they might not be getting their information from wikipedia but rather from the creepypasta wiki or from the scp foundation which if you're not familiar these are both repositories of online creepypastas which are again they're they're fictional narratives but they very often present themselves in a way that is sort of designed to, to sort of sound true. Um, not, and I don't think that, that the users are out to, you know, they're not being malicious in, in creating these stories. I think they're interested in telling scary stories for the same reason that people like to tell scary stories in any context. But again, um, aspects of these media are such uh, that those origins can be obscured. Um, this, I, I'm sorry, Ileana, that that wasn't a super direct answer, but I hope that makes sense. That was perfect. No, thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Uh, Sony made Dante says Sony made a movie on Slender Man. Yeah, it came out in I think 2019. It was um, it was horrible. <laughs> it was a terrible film. Interesting, only in that it claimed to be adapting the Slender Man mythos, but was just guilty of the worst sins of horror filmmaking. Um, Stuart says Mythology Entertainment owns Slender Man. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. You like SCPs? I, I have an exercise that my students in a course I teach every semester about monsters do, where they, uh, they create their own short adaptations of creepypasta. It's usually pretty successful. Uh, the Russian sleep experiment, I think, has probably been the most popular one. That's an SCP. Um, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Um, look it up if you haven't. It's, it's pretty interesting. 
Um, Karina says, another example of why students need to be taught how to read digital media through a critical lens. That's, that's a good point, Karina. I think you're right. I, I think that um, we all do need to be critical in our engagements with this kind of material. Um, but one thing that I hope to get across is that um, that that can often be easier said than done. And by that, I mean, again, the nature of the internet is such that um, we are not always able to see aspects of the backstage, as it were. Um, for example, we're not always privy to the code that goes into building a website or building a particular media sharing platform. And uh, as I'm sure you all know, a lot of contemporary uh, work has been done about how YouTube algorithms can point YouTube viewers down very particular channels of media consumption, um, supposedly in the interest of providing them with material that they will find interesting. But uh, these kinds of algorithmic affordances can have the effect of um, exposing people to radicalizing content, to content that has um, potentially unforeseen and very serious social and political and individual consequences. So yes, you're exactly right. We do need to, to develop um, better critical media literacy practices. And I think we need to understand how users engage with these media in the first place and how um, even, even if we do attempt to inculcate better practices of media consumption, that the nature of the media is often such that we really have our work cut out for us. Hey, um, uh, I got a question real quick. If, sorry if I'm inter interrupting. No, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, just a uh, quick aside. I, I'm the one that's talked of, said, the, or said the comment about the Slender Man movie. I watched it with my friends. Great oh. bad movie night <laughs> movie, <laughs> but just, uh, just an interesting thing that I, that I uh, found out about recently was that they didn't actually show the Slender Man movie in, I think, uh, a yeah, a majority of Wisconsin. I didn't oh. know that until recently, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But um, yeah, my question was, uh, I guess, uh, kind of working off of Slender Man. You know, recently there's been more things about uh, uh, what was it? Two years ago, there was that whole thing about the. Uh, the Momo challenge and that whole thing. And then there's the, uh -huh. I think there was last year, there was something called like the blue whale challenge or something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know that one, but I believe it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of these sort of, I've gathered that it mostly circulates around children. And I recall, I think, yeah, it was two years ago during the Momo challenge mm. whole ordeal. I think there was a, uh, the school division near me had to put out a notice to all parents uh, telling them to talk to their kids about it. So oh, wow. I was just wondering, you know, what your take on these sort of uh, these more modern, I guess, creepypasta things are and, you know, how that ties into, you know, children on the internet and, you know, having to, um, you know, teach them what's real and what's fake and, you know, what to believe and what not to believe and sort of parenting children on this digital age. Oh, that's a very good question, Dante. Yeah, it's very complex, isn't it? Um, especially again, when when so many media are particularly concerned with disguising their own reality or fiction, and and you know those are slippery terms, of course. But um, yeah, how can we teach media literacy in an age of you know the, this? But let me back up for a minute. For a long time, people touted the supposedly um, democratizing potential of the internet and related technologies. Um, folks in, in media studies and cultural studies and anthropology and other fields talked a lot about um, the incredible access to information and to tools of representation like video technologies and the tremendous power that the internet would, would give people without regard to ethnicity or background or economic status or whatever. And surely there, there is some of that. Um, some, some of that is true, I mean, to a certain extent, although the digital divide continues to be a very real thing. That is to say, not everyone has equal access to digital technologies. Um, but as time has gone on in digital ethnography, in anthropology and in folklore and in related fields, we've come more and more and more to learn in the past 20 years or so in particular that that democratizing effect was 
perhaps overstated um, that what really happens is in some cases a democratizing effect. You know, we, we've seen political organization happen online in, in ways that have led to, you know, very real and important structural change. We've also seen digital technologies enable the kind of organizing that led in the United States to the uprising on January 6th. Um, in other words, it's far less of a rosy picture than some early theorists of internet and digital cultures made it out to be. Um, what that means for young people in particular is that as um, Ileana, I, or as, as uh, folks have suggested um, here and elsewhere, um, inculcating best practices in terms of media liter literacy definitely is critically important. But also having, for people who are making policy decisions, uh, as well as parents, having a better, more intimate understanding of how those vulnerable people are using these technologies is also critically important. Um, so it's, it's not just about placing restrictions, in other words, on what people can and cannot do in digital spaces. Rather, I think that at least a partial answer lies in parents and, and again, policymakers and others um, really having an intimate understanding of how platforms are used. Uh, very often, digital tools will be created with one thing in mind and users will adopt the platform but end up using it in a completely different way than what its designers intended. Um, so the way to understand those uses is to be on the ground, so to speak, to, to do careful, close, engaged participant observation with people as they interact with these technologies and with other people via these technologies. And by doing that, by gaining a greater understanding, which many scholars have been doing for, for quite a number of years now, but by continuing to do that, by continuing to understand how people are engaging with these technologies, I think we can begin to to find answers to your question, Dante. Unfortunately, I don't, again, I, I don't have a definitive answer as to how to um, protect people to truth or falsity in digital media. Um, but I think that one step is encouraging people to recognize what truth claims are, how they exist in all media, and how all of us go about this process of belief formation in our own lives through a combination of experience, you know, what, what I do in my own daily life and things that are given to me, so to speak, by culture, by society, by institutions, by religion, by science, et cetera. If as a, as a culture, if we cultivate a better understanding of the complexity of that process of belief formation, then I think we'll be in a better position to help people make better choices about what to believe. And that's a little bit, uh, that actually kind of oversimplifies it, of course, because to, to imply that believing in something is a choice is not necessarily true or accurate. But hopefully it's clear what I mean, that we can devise strategies to help people um, believe in a healthier and more productive way. I'm sorry, everybody. I saw a lot of stuff happening in the chat over there. Um, let me scroll back up really quick and see. Um, I think the, the next question I think is Leo's. Uh, Leo says, can you talk about reverse ostension and its place in Slender Man and folklore as a whole? Uh, so reverse ostension is that idea that I came up with a very awkward term to talk about um, basically the opposite of what people do when they legend trip. So uh, ostension is a term that folklorists borrowed from semiotics. Um, that refers to showing something di directly uh, instead of representing it through words or some other kind of representational act. So I could say, I could say the word book to convey the idea of a book, or I could show you this book. You know, I could just hold it up and, and show it to you. That would be an act of ostention. So that idea got imported into folklore study. Um, primarily to refer to this thing called legend tripping, which as I said, is, is when a person visits a site specifically because it's associated with a legend narrative. Um, that's a little bit different from this kind of ostension, but it, it has again to do with uh, experiencing something in a direct way rather than 
in a mediated or representational way. So reverse ascension was this awkward term that I came up with to describe how I think uh, Slenderman moved in the opposite direction, where you know, in, in real life, so to speak, uh, people might hear a legend of the Jersey Devil, for example, or in French Canada, the Loop Guru, or um, the Mothman of Point Pleasant. So someone might hear a pre-existing narrative about one of these beings and then decide to go there and experience it for themselves, maybe to see if they can encounter that, that being. Um, with Slenderman, it was, it was the opposite. There weren't narratives of Slenderman, but people were drawing from existing um, real world legends and stories of, of supernatural beings in order to create a new narrative complex that was then available for ostension just as other kinds of narratives were. Um, so with regard to other folklore, um, if, if people are consciously crafting narratives uh, in, in, a, in a way that parallels that process, then we could say that reverse ostension might be happening. It's, it's a clunky concept though, I, not, I admit, but I think that it's a particularly um, um, iconic one or a particularly representative one, I, sh uh, I should say, of the digital age in which people become really intensely interested in particular kinds of narratives or particular kinds of media and then decide that they're interested in creating their own. Um, and that would be an example of those democratizing potentialities of the internet actually kind of panning out um, in the sense that, you know, many, so many people now have smartphones and, and access to video technology and they can create um, films and other, other types of media uh, on their own. Um, so reverse ostension, I think, can continue to be um, a concept. Well, it does continue to be a concept that we see in action on these internet spaces like the Creepypasta Wiki or the SCP Foundation, where these uh, new fictional narratives are made in a way that strategically pulls pieces from other places, um, cobbles together bits of experience, uh, narrated experience in order to, to create a new narrative complex. I hope that makes sense. Um, let's see. Um, Sorry, my window's a little smushed here. Um, Aurora says, do you have any ideas about what we might be able to do in order to sort through to truth and fiction among the mass of information available to us? Well, again, that's, that's a good question. And um, uh, some colleague, a colleague in media studies, uh, whose name is Whitney Phillips, uh, she's at Syracuse University, is, um, has done a, a great deal of work in this area, mis and disinformation. And um, a recent, publication that she did with um, she and her colleague Ryan Milner. Uh, they published a book called You Are Here, which is about navigating uh, mis- and disinformation online. That book is a useful way of uh, conceptualizing the flows of mis- and disinformation. Um, their approach is to kind of recast the, the media environment in ecological terms. So they talk about pollution and it's spreading through um, various mediated or media spaces. Um, and they offer some useful insights on how to think about how the flows of mis- and disinformation affect all of us. And um, to think about how our actions in mediated spaces can have unforeseen consequences. So that's a really good place to go for um, kind of a checklist of, of things that we can do or avoid doing to navigate um, our, our the media reality that we're facing. Um, Stuart says it let, oh yeah, the Slenderman movie left a bad taste in people's mouths. Yeah, I, I, I do remember people being initially upset that the movie was being produced. Um, Momo, <laughs> Momo was terrifying. Yeah, Momo was pretty freaky. Um, Ileana, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually don't have my Dybbuk box here with me. It's, I'm, I'm out of state at present. I'm in New York, and my Dybbuk box is back in Pennsylvania, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's just a little thing. It, you know, to be perfectly honest, it, I think the person bought it at somewhere like Pier 1. It has a certain Pier 1 kind of a look to it. And they melted wax. They sealed it with, with um, uh, sealing wax. And... Uh, 
it it looks you know strategically archaic and I kind of want to open it although I know I'm not supposed to because there's something in it I, you can shake it around and you hear something rattling in it and I really want to know what it is but I haven't I haven't taken that step yet but if you don't hear from me after tonight maybe you'll know why <laughs> um oh, a couple other people wanted to see that too yeah sorry guys i wish i had thought ahead to have it here um aaron writes i'm a teacher and i've worked with middle to high school kids every once in a while we get emails telling us to talk about the newest social media trends especially if they're considered harmful oh yeah so it's hard to keep up because there are so many um yeah i i completely understand aaron and and again the, the same comment that i made uh, a moment ago you might consider checking out that book um you are here um by whitney phillips and ryan milner it's it's concerned explicitly and directly with navigating all of this pardon me bullshit that we encounter today and of course i, I don't want to imply that that bullshit is anything brand new of course it's it's often been perhaps always been a part of um human mediated interactions because media in the, the broad sense of that term, of course, right? I don't mean just like the news media, but I mean all forms of mediated communication introduce potential for, for human manipulation. I mean, that's what they are after all, right? And something is mediated when it comes between the sender of a message and, and the receiver of the message. So I don't, I don't wanna make it sound as though I'm disparaging the, the very idea of media, far from it. Um, but the potential, particularly with participatory media for, uh, kind of screwy disconnects is very high. So staying on top of that stuff is really important and really, really difficult. Um, oh, Stuart, you went to the Mothman town? You went to Point Pleasant? That's cool. I have not been there. I'm very jealous. I would like to go. There is um, there's a, a YouTube series. Um, a, it's a PBS series called Storied. Um, it used to be called Monstrum, but now I think they expanded it to include stuff that's not only monster focused um but um uh the the presenter of that series her name is dr emily zarka she did an episode on mothman in which she visited point pleasant and um it's it's very good oh karina thank you for sharing the link and i feel like in the interest of full disclosure i should tell you all that um whitney phillips happens to be my partner uh, she's in the other room at the moment so i I don't want you to think that I'm telling you to purchase the book just for that reason, but it actually is about um, precisely this topic. So you might, you may find it interesting. You can probably um, access it through your university library or something like that. Um, Stuart says, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped down a little bit. Uh, Murray says there another topic that's interesting the local interest in being haunted or having a legend attached to them oh yes yeah the tourist industry is famously interested in um, in hauntings haunted haunted properties and locations I actually um, some some years back I was I was house hunting a little bit online and came across an ad for a home in Pennsylvania which is where I, I live full-time and um, <laughs> the ad it was it was sort of a beautiful old colonial home and it was painted this really cool shade of purple and I, I liked it very much um, and it was described as only slightly haunted and there was apparently a, a a scream that might occasionally awaken you at the in the nighttime I was really I was really drawn to that place um, unfortunately I think it's sold already um, well that was a number of years ago now that makes me think of that famous case in in uh, I think it was in New York State of the house which uh, the haunted house that was sold and its hauntedness wasn't disclosed. So uh, I, I um, somewhere I listened to a podcast about it. Maybe it was in the Criminal podcast. Interesting. Yeah, and they, they the this, the lawsuit was successful. Like they successfully got out of the sale. Did so, they really? Yeah, and, and so oh, it, 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 it it plays in popular culture as like. Uh, the court affirming the existence of ghosts, but it's more that the reputation of of a place as being haunted is something which uh, that a seller has an obligation to uh, to reveal because that affects property values because it was something locally known. 
Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, 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 if you give me a second, I can probably find the case. But I, sure, I want to yeah. ask another question real quick, too. And that's that, like, I was thinking back to uh, the Blair Witch Project. And, of course, I was kind of guilty of looking down on those people who thought that it was real at the time. But that's because... Like, I was 17 at the time, man. So well, cut me some slack. I, I was, too. <laughs> exactly 17, I think. 99, right? Yep. And it, it was... Um, but I, I followed, you know, film stuff very carefully at that time, far more so than now. And it had been at, at, at festivals. And so I was aware of it as a festival pick, you know. So it, it, it landed on my radar in a very different way than the people. Oh, yeah. It, you know, uh, but and I didn't really realize that there was a kind of proto social media campaign designed yeah. to generate this, this, uh, this buzz and gossip around it. Yeah, the, um, the website was really, really successful in, mm -hmm. in creating a furor of interest. But I, I learned about it like reading Roger Ebert's reports from from uh, <laughs> Sundance and, and so on. So it's a whole different. Oh, uh, so you had a leg up. Kind See, of, my... yes. Like, uh, it's, so, but I, I, I guess my question is, is like, is, is there a reliable way of telling people who actually believe something from people who are playing along for like the fun of the game? And I know that this has come up with QAnon recently. Like, mm. was it a, a kind of LARP or a thought experiment or whatever the proper term is that got out of hand at some point? Like, are, is this even a distinction we can neatly draw anymore? Um, but but on 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 uh, on Reddit at one point when I was dabbling in Reddit to distract myself now and again, which I stopped doing because it was too distracting, there was a person saying, "Oh, you know, I fooled so many people with this fake story that I made up one time." And the question I asked was like, are you sure that they were fooled so much as they decided to operate under the premise that it was true? Because those yeah. seem to be different things, right? Mm -hmm. well, I'm not sure that there's really a question here, but I'm wondering how we draw these distinctions or should we? That's an excellent partial sort of question. And I, I am right there with you. I think you. I think you're exactly right, Murray. I think... Um, we can never really truly know what's going on in, in the, the minds of other humans. I mean, all we can ultimately do is, is measure what they say against what they do and, you know, make our best guesses on, the, on that basis. So I think you're exactly right. And this is a perpetual issue with studies of belief more generally. Um, I did my doctoral dissertation research in Ireland on fairy belief and do, do people in Ireland actually believe in fairies? It's very, very hard to, to answer that question in any kind of definitive way. I mean, people will give ambivalent answers to that question, but then they'll also avoid going into fairy forts, which are these um, Iron Age defensive structures that are all kind of all over the Irish landscape. Um, because there are, you know, there are traditions of supernatural consequences if you interfere with those kinds of places. Um, so do they, do they really believe or is it, is it something kind of between belief and like playful disbelief? That's an excellent question. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think for purposes of analysis and also potentially for purposes of, of policy making or at least devising best practices, um, we, can, we can use the language of belief in discussions of the actions that people actually take. Uh, claiming to be motivated by particular things. So when, um, you know, when the guy shot up the pizza parlor in DC in, in the event that came to be called Pizzagate, um, believing that it was a front for uh, a pedophile sex ring, um, did he truly in his heart of hearts believe that I, I can't say that for sure, but he did really shoot the place up. Um, and so narratives that enable playing along in that way, whether it's actually belief or not, um, I think can still be approached from the angle of belief, understanding that belief itself is actually really, really ambivalent and really ultimately impossible to quantify. So, so I, I love that point and I, I agree with you completely. I'm, are these distinctions ultimately meaningless? They might be. I think they still, some, still have some usefulness in, in allowing us to kind of think our way through these issues of discourse. But I, I also think that you're right, that they, they may 
um, belie or obscure the really complex mental realities that we all have going on all the time. Um, did I miss anybody's questions in the chat? I'm sorry if I did. Sometimes I, in scrolling through, I miss, I might miss a comment or two. I'm not sure that you did. I, I just posted a link to that podcast about the haunted house. Um, oh, excellent. Thank and, you. And I think it makes the point that subsequently the, uh, it's haunted status has become a sales piece rather than a demerit. Um, funny how things go. <laughs> yeah, I find that I find that to be a draw for sure. I would be interested in uh, a home like that. Mm. That, of course, reminds me of perhaps the most famous case of a stigmatized property, at least in the U.S., um, the Amityville horror case. Uh, I just actually taught. We may have discussed this previously, Murray. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but. I teach a unit on the Amityville Horror in my monsters class every semester. Um, it's it's a, a really fascinating case, and and um, the Lutz's lawyer uh, came out as or, or or went on record claiming that the entire thing was a hoax that they had cooked up as a way to make money, but the Lutzes themselves denied that. Um, there's uh, I th I think you and I may have spoken about um, the documentary My Amityville Horror. It's a if uh, for everyone in the audience if you haven't if you haven't seen that I really recommend it. It focuses on Danny Lutz, the son of the Lutz family who moved into the home on Long Island uh, that was supposedly you know the site of some very serious and disturbing paranormal events. Um, regardless of claims of hoaxing and and the, all the confusion surrounding the reality of the events at that house, Danny Lutz, the the son who's now grown up. Um, continues to maintain that the events were all real and, and has clearly been traumatized by something that happened, um, whatever, whether it was supernatural or not, I can't say. But that actually gets back again to that, that idea of belief. I mean, does Danny Lutz, who claims that he really believed literally in the, the demonic reality of the events that he was subject to in that house, does he in his heart of hearts believe that that's the case? I don't know the answer, but he definitely acts as if he does. And and that in and of itself, I think, is something worth um, investigating. Not in not in the sense of debunking or disproving, but in the sense of trying to understand how this narrative and the associated experiences fit into his everyday life. And indeed, the life of the community, because Amityville continues to be known as, well, as Amityville. Oh, Reddit no sleep. Yeah, our no sleep. Yeah, I, I actually, to, I gotta be honest, I'm not super familiar with Reddit. Um, for whatever reason, it's a platform that just never really, I never really got into, but I've heard of no sleep and I've heard of the, I've heard of the stories there. I, oh, I didn't know that they were real though. Are they, they're stories that people claim that they actually experience? Oh, but they're actually, they are fiction. Eliana says. Interesting. Uh, oh, here's a, a question from Aurora. Uh, I'd be curious to know in your studies of folklore, is there a myth, is there a myth or legend you found particularly fascinating? Oh, that's um that's a tough one. Um I I began in folklore because I, I primarily wanted to study Irish folklore. Uh, so when I, I, I think I may have said before, I did dissertation research in, in Ireland um, dealing with the fairies. I was particularly interested in, in supernatural belief that was connected to the physical landscape, um, to how people engaged with aspects of the landscape. Um, so I really love, um, you know, medieval Irish epic legendary literature, like the, the Toyn Bocunia, the, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, if you are familiar with that at all. Um, stories of the old gods of Ireland and Druids and the hero Cucullin and all of that. Um, I also, I like classical mythology, uh, although I admit I'm really rusty. It's been a while. Um, but I've, I've always been drawn to the supernatural in, in all of its forms. And that's, that's a, a term that, you know, is very broad and has a, a lot of meanings. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think Ireland, Irish folklore um, is the stuff that really kind of hooked me. 
that and um, the video game series Fatal Frame, which is uh, about ghosts and, and fighting ghosts with a magical camera. And a bunch of the main characters in that series are folklorists. And that, that made me really interested in studying this thing called folklore. Yeah, I agree, Dante. I love Fatal Frame. I wish they'd bring the rest of them over to, the, over to uh, North America. Mm. Some of the scariest moments in, in visual media, I think, are in Fatal Frame, in my humble opinion. <laughs> I, I like, I played the original Silent Hill quite a lot when it first came out in the late 90s. Um, for various reasons, I'm not really sure why, but I, I didn't really play much of the rest of the series. I know that's sort of sacrilege. I know of it. I know that um, Silent Hill 2 is like one of the most beloved horror games of all time. Um, I played a little bit of the third Silent Hill. I like them. I, I like the Silent Hill games. Um, I just, I, I really couldn't tell you why I didn't play them. It just may have been whatever was going on in my life at the time. I don't know. Um, very atmospheric for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, Ileana has a question. Uh, in your studies, have you ever experienced a supernatural occurrence or believed? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, nothing really definitive. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the, the very first time I was in Ireland when I was an undergraduate, I, I studied abroad just for a semester in Ireland. And some friends and I were walking through the, the mountains in um, the west of Ireland. And um, we, we, as part of our study abroad program, we had gone to this like uh, they, I think they called it a retreat center or something like that. It was, it was just like an, a, like a camp for grownups. They had like um, obstacle courses and things, you know, outdoor activities and stuff. And it was, it was just like a weekend trip, but we were, um, we were on this trip and we were, three of us were walking around um, in the mountains at night. And we, we came up this sort of a, uh, a low rise on, into a flat place in the hills. And it, it looked as though, it was pitch black outside, but it looked as though there was a, uh, a, a dog, a big black dog sitting in the middle of this, this clearing. And um, you know, in, in some parts of the world, of course, black dogs are, are death messengers. And so um, we, all kind of, we all kind of came to a stop at the same moment. And uh, I sort of turned over my shoulder and said to the, the other two people that I was with, I think we should get out of here. And it, they had already taken off running <laughs> down the hill. So I turned tail and, and got out of there. Um, went back to the same spot the next day and there, there, was, um, there was a clump of grass, a big clump of grass in the same place that the, the shape had been. So was it a black dog or, or was, it, uh, was it just a clump of grass? I don't know. But the other two thought that they had seen a dog as well. <laughs> That's a good one for sure. Thanks. <laughs> so it's seven o'clock now, and that's basically how long we have you booked for right now. Okay. So uh, if, unless there's anything pressing, I think maybe we can, we can uh, conclude this class now. But I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Talbert, for having, uh, having joined us. Thank you very much for having me. Shared you, some of your research. And this was, uh, I think, uh, very interesting and enlightening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, everybody, for your, for your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and good luck with your studies. Uh, I'd also like to, because I forgot to do so before, thank the Institute for the Humanities and uh, the Department of English Film, Television, and Media for their financial support of this event. Thank you all very much. It's been a, a real pleasure. And uh...